Spine Institute here in Florida, located near Orlando. We're located on the space coast of Florida. And this is where SpaceX launches their rockets, where NASA used to launch their rockets and space shuttles. 10 years ago last Thursday was the end. Yeah, the last shuttle launch. And of course, the military satellites from Satellite Beach as well. And um, we're gonna be performing the Duke Laser Disc Repair. This is an endoscopic annular debridement with a discectomy. Our patient has back pain. It travels into her left side. And she's here with us in the operating room awake. Hi, it's Dr. Duke Majin. We're gonna get started, okay? Can you hear me all right? That's my hand on your back. Can you feel me? Now, if it hurts, just say, ouch, okay? Try to relax. You're doing great. You're going to feel a little stick and burn. That's just some numbing medicine going in, okay? So just bear with me. Everything's okay. Now, we're going to be doing a repair on her L4-5 and L5-S1 discs because that's where her pain is coming from. Five cc's injected. How far down your left leg do you get pain? It goes down to your calf? Has it ever gone past your calf? Into your foot? All right. And any numbness or tingling? Okay. All right, we're gonna get started. If you feel pain, discomfort, just say ouch, and that will tell me I need to give you some more numbing medicine, okay? Now, don't try to move, okay? Just say ouch. Tell me if the pain is in your back or your leg. So say ouch back or ouch leg, all right? All right. I'm gonna give you some more numbing medicine. You might feel a little pressure back there, a little discomfort, yep. That's normal. I apologize. And we're gonna put you to sleep soon, but it, we need about 10 minutes of your help, okay? I think I'm a little higher than I wanna be. Sorry, I mean a little lower. I need to be a little higher. But let's see if we can make this work. Sean, let's go back to a lateral. So our first target will be the L5-S1. We're gonna use a special x-ray machine called a fluoroscope. And the fluoroscope we use is the top of the line fluoroscope for safety and for quality in terms of image quality. So it doesn't do us any good if we can't see what we're doing. We need to have really good visibility of the areas we're working on because the pathway to get to these areas lots of times is just a few millimeters. Um, so we have to be very, very accurate. And an x-ray machine that is inaccurate is not gonna help us achieve our goal of accuracy, obviously. All right, you're doing great. Shot. So we're a little bit lower than I wanna be in terms of our trajectory. So I'll redirect. She's not, she seems to be nice and comfortable. Yes? It's a little different protocol, shot. Uh, good for you. Yeah. It's just a matter of figuring it out. I can feel the facet joints. They're um, right there. Let's go with AP. I just want to verify. I feel like I'm a little more medial than I want to be, so I may try to redirect, and if I can't, I'll just um, start with a, a point a little more lateral maybe even a little more high. Yeah, so that is the facet joint. And we're actually very close to getting around it. So I'm just gonna try to redirect first. Lateral. Any questions from our audience? John? All right. No, not yet. So. Uh, for those of you who have been with us for a long time, Sean, who used to do our broadcast, doesn't uh, broadcast for us anymore, and John 
has now taken over the responsibility of broadcasting. Um, so I hired somebody whose name sounded like Sean, but it's John for our audience. You like that? Who laughed? Oh, good. I'm glad somebody got it. You know, it's not easy coming up with humorous comments during surgery, but thank God someone appreciates my sense of humor. All right, so let's see, right there. I'm feeling the facet. I need to go lateral to it, most likely. Just lay still. You're fine. Everything's good. Shot. So we're so close, yet so far away. Just lay still. Shot. Yeah, you're doing really good, all right? Just hang in there. Again, a narrow window. Shot. Yep, that's a perfect trajectory from a lateral view, but I bet on the AP I'm too medial. Give me an AP. Either too medial or too lateral. That's what I got to figure out because it's not going. I'm feeling bone, and that bone is going to be either, um, I think it's too low for transverse process, but there it is. Interesting. It's sacrum. So I need to be a little bit more medial, and then we'll be fine. Okay, back to a lateral view. All right, that's why you do x-ray, because you can't guess, no matter how good you are, you'll never be able to tell what bone it is for sure. You just have to look. So you gotta take your time and do it right. If you do that, the surgery can be done very successfully and safely. Shot? How you feeling there? Shot? Yeah, AP, so we're s uncomfortable or comfortable? Any pain down your leg? Perfect, you're doing awesome. Yeah, we're perfect. Everything is going as good as it could possibly go. And in about 10 minutes, we'll have you asleep, okay? All right, I couldn't hear what she said. Yeah, you'll ha oh, you're looking? <laughs> you're not allowed to look. I'm kidding. Of course you can look. I didn't know you were, you were looking. I feel so, huh? Oh, yeah, well, they can watch. I didn't know you were watching. That's good. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a little unexpected. But, you know, there is a place where patients do watch their surgery. It's just not here. Huh? Facebook live. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. But I mean, they watch it live. All right, we're, we're, we got into the hard one, which is L5S1. All right, I hope I didn't jinx myself. Now I'm making an incision, and we're going to do the second uh, access point into L45. Blood pressure is good. It's perfect. Doctor, you're really, really on fire today. All right, thank you. When my anesthesiologist does a great job, it makes my job so much easier. So this is how I like it, you know? All right, now we gotta line up four or five. I mean, the four pedicles perfect, Jordan. Actually, Jordan, I think you're really good. I just don't know if we can improve it like half a degree. And I'm being a little picky, I guess, but I'm always gonna ask for as much as I can get. All right, so. Little one drop of blood, no big deal. Sean, I need to aim for that L45 disc. Sean, too low. So I'm gonna redirect, Sean. A little higher there, it's better. And I need to dock on the facet, too low. I'm gonna pull back and redirect. You can do a little redirecting without pulling back, but just remember, you're going to have to go through that area later. Shot. Is that it right there? Okay. So it's looking much better. And, yeah, I can feel the facet. And, again, I'm just going to go slightly lateral to it. So I'm touching the superior facet of L5. If For those of you who understand the anatomy... The needle tip is just touching that superior facet. 
shot. Now I just want to round it and we're going to go into the disc now. Where do you feel it? Yeah, that's your bad disc. We found it. Of course, relax. Yeah, we're inside. We went through your tear. So we're in on both discs. So you, you're very lucky. It went very smooth. We lost two drops of blood. Two drops of blood. Huh? Are you comfortable? Have you watched my surgeries before? So we've given you a little bit of medicine to make you sleepy, but do you remember what happens next? <laughs> Wishful thinking. Very close. Yes. Yeah, we got to test the disc, right? So I'm going to just, I'm going to do you a little favor. I'm going to do some drawing for you, okay? All right, let's get the light on. So what we're going to do now, we've, we've gone through the first step, which is to gain access to the tears at L45, L5S1, left side. We're not doing anything on the right side. There's no need to. The, L, the, um, the bones in her back look like this. There's the tailbone called the sacrum, okay? Sacrum, I'm gonna abbreviate it SAC. And then there's the L5 bone here. <laughs> then there's another bone here called the L4. And it just stands for, L stands for lumbar. Because the spine has bones and we name the bones based on the region of the spine. So this bone here is L4, this bone here is L5, and this is sacrum, and the first sacral vertebrae is called S1, okay? I didn't make this stuff up, somebody else did, but it's helpful to understand what we're doing. Now between the bones are these cushions, and for the longest time, everyone thought the cushions are nothing. Who cares, they're nothing, they're not important. It's kind of like how we used to dump garbage in the ocean. Right? We used to take all of our garbage from Los Angeles, big cities, and we used to just go out 10 miles and just dump it in the ocean. We thought, oh, the oceans are bottomless and they can suck up the garbage and nobody will ever care. But how wrong we were. We've destroyed our oceans, polluted them, and now we realize the mistake we've made. Okay? Same thing with lots of things in life. Human beings as a, as, as, a, uh, as a race, we make a lot of mistakes. And one of the mistakes we've made for the last hundreds of years is to think that the disc, which is the cushion between the bones, is not important. It's just a cushion. It's not just a cushion. It's actually a source of pain. And it's the number one source of back pain in the world. See that? Number one. And that's what we've discovered at Duke Spine Institute. Unfortunately, the rest of the world is taking a long time to figure it out and catch up. That's why we broadcast so they can learn. Anyway, she's got these tears in her disc, one there and one there. That's where her pain's coming from. So can we confirm it? Of course. How bad is that on a scale of one to 10? What was the highest it went to? The highest? 10. Is that where you typically get your back pain? Is that where you typically get your back pain? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so we just tested the bottom disc. You can see on the x-ray. John, did you show them? And look at where the needle touches the die. That's where the tear is. It's huge. It looks like a, <laughs> it actually looks like a caterpillar. That's pretty cool. Anybody ever see a monarch butterfly caterpillar? That's what it looks like with its little antennas. You see that? Right? Anyway, we're poking the caterpillar in the butt with the needle. And basically that last inch of the caterpillar is the tear in the back of the disc. And that's what's causing all of her pain. Okay? So she had a 10 out of 10 pain there. And <clears throat> we're gonna put her to sleep in just a minute. But I do need her help. Okay? Um, we use this as a two, two reasons, actually three reasons. Number one, we want to we wanna do a chromodiscogram. We want to see inside the disc on the x-ray, make sure that we can see the tear, the, t the disc, no, you know, the anatomy we expect. The second reason is to see if the disc is the cause of the patient's pain. How bad did that get on a scale of 1 to 10? 
Okay, you get to go to sleep, and then you get to watch your surgery later and see what we did, and thank us, because that pain you have is going to be gone for the rest of your life. 10 over 10. So that was L45. Now let's look at the L45 disc on the lateral view. Let's bring it up, John. You all see that? Huh? You're right, Luis. I always start with 5-1. Luis is wonderful. Luis has been with me for how many years now? Oh, seven, plus. seven plus years. You all see that x-ray there? Do you have it up, John? Yes, I have the x-rays up. All right, now look at the top needle going into the disc. Right where it goes into the disc, it looks like a caterpillar going the opposite direction, doesn't it? Like it's crawling out into the neural foramen. Well, you want to know what that is? That caterpillar torso is the tear and the herniation. And the dye, the black dye, is wrapping around the nerve root. And that looks like the antlers of the caterpillar. If it had antlers like a deer, that little deer head in the foramen with the antlers, the antlers are wrapping around the nerve root. It's kind of like showing you that this herniation is related to the nerve root. It's touching the nerve root, okay? And all that is scar tissue from inflammation. So we're going to treat her back pain, get rid of it, and we're going to get rid of her leg symptoms with this surgery. All right. She asleep? All right. Can you count from 1 to 100 out loud? Okay, but so when I finish with the second discogram, that's when you get to put her to sleep rather than waiting. Okay, as long as you know that, that's fine. For whatever reason, I know you haven't done it, but that's fine. Her IV's working okay? Good. All right, shot. Can you count from 1 to 100 out loud, dear? If you make it to 100, we don't pay the anesthesiologist today. It's funny, she's like, I don't know, should we do that or not? <laughs> should I speed up or slow down? <laughs> right? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> if you wake up in pain, then you know you counted too fast. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right. Any questions from our audience watching? And by the way, I get all kinds of contact forms and emails and texts and letters from people around the world that really enjoy watching these surgeries. It's because they learn so much. You're not going to find these teaching, these pearls that I give you all anywhere else in the world. We are literally the cutting edge of spine surgery at Duke Spine Institute. And we have information that isn't even published in medical journals or books because we're the ones discovering it here. And honestly, uh, I've lost faith in the whole publication, peer review publication process. It's just pretty much a big hoax. Um, yeah. It used to be very scientific and unbiased, and now it's incredibly biased. It's just like... You have to be part of the, the good old boys club in order to get published, which I'm not part of the good old boys club because I never believed in the good old boys club. I still don't. I don't think it's right. They still, I believe in science, fact, knowledge, the pursuit of truth. And unfortunately, publishing in journals these days requires not truth, but being connected and, you know, scratching someone's back who will scratch your back. And it's basically just a political system. I was shocked today to learn, uh, ready, reading an article, which we're going to talk about in one of our blog posts, I hope, that the medical device companies, the spine companies, the ones that sell the screws and rods, the ones that don't want you to know about this surgery you're watching right now, because we don't put any metal in the patient. Yes, there's metal going in, but just to do the surgery, but we don't leave screws and rods. We call those implants. We don't, we don't do spinal implant surgery. This is more advanced than spinal implant surgery. I've been doing spinal implant surgery 26 years one of the best spinal implanters in the entire world. However, we've moved away from implanting screws and rods and fusing 
to natural healing of the disc, promoting the natural healing of the disc. That's what we do here. But these companies, the spinal implant companies like AlphaTech, Nuvasiv, Medtronic, uh, Johnson & Johnson, it turns out that they pay surgeons to, to do surgeries with their screws and rods. And I knew that they paid surgeons money. Uh, I just saw a lawsuit recently. One spine surgeon is suing Medtronic and won $112 million that he was due in royalty. So what does this mean? Do you really think the spine surgeon discovered something worth $112 million? It's a new kind of screw. I mean, literally, there's 100 spine screws out there. And he has he created one that's a little different. What's really happening is the implant companies are paying the spine surgeons royalties as bribes to promote the use of their screws and rods. And you, the patients with back and neck problems getting fusions done, are the suckers who are basically the fodder. You guys are being used to sell their screws and rods and cages, okay? And I was shocked at how much money these spinal implant companies pay collectively, about a billion dollars a year to spine surgeons. And I get zero of that. I mean, literally, even when I was putting in lots and lots and lots of screws and rods, I never got a dime because it's illegal. It's honestly illegal and unethical. And there are lots of spine surgeons that are very powerful. There's an old saying, 10% of the spine surgeons do 90% of the surgery. Okay? And it's true. 10% of the spine surgeons do 90% of the surgery. And these surgeons are pumping in screws and rods and cages and metal plates into patients' bodies. And not only are they doing it, but they control other surgeons who are doing it. So, for example, imagine if somebody was the chairman of a neurosurgery department at a prestigious university and they do a thousand spine surgeries a year well that chairman will say we're only going to use Medtronic screws and rods at this university and that university will use Medtronic and in exchange Medtronic pays that surgeon tens of millions of dollars a year for using their implants this happens all the time it's illegal but it's hidden from the public it's hidden from the government it's hidden from regulators but that's what's happening. And those same people are preventing this technology from getting out to the world for you all to see that we can fix spines now without using metal and plastic and bone graft, that it can be done naturally with a laser, as long as you do the Duke laser disc repair. Shot. All right, so we're inside the L5S1 disc and I've taken the dilator out. It's like a long skinny pencil, but it's not really a pencil. It's just a dilator. And now we have a tube that goes from the outside world into the disc. You see that? It's, it was, it travels along the same path that the needle did that we put in earlier. And through this seven millimeter tube, I'm gonna repair two discs that normally the patient would have a giant incision from here to here. Can you guys see this? John, from one finger to the other, that's about a 12 inch incision. Normally in this kind of patient, you need a 12 inch incision to do fusion. Uh, yes, we can see it by the way. Yeah, all right. Yeah, it's the opposite side, so thank you. So this is truly revolutionary surgery and we've been doing it now 16 years here at Duke Spine. And I've been trying to teach other surgeons to do it. I've gone to the big meetings. I've been accepted uh, to present my research and my, my technique and everyone's come and listened. I've, I've taught my technique in Hong Kong. Um, I've taught it in, at the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, at the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, at the um, Society for the um, Advancement in Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery at the Florida Neurosurgical Society, at the Southern Neurosurgical Society. They all have had the opportunity to learn how to do this endoscopic surgery for years and years, and yet they choose to do fusions, okay? Why? 
because clearly they're getting more money from fusions. But who's not benefiting? The patients. Do I make more money doing fusions? Absolutely. But why do I do laser surgery? Because it's better for the patient. There's no big incision. There's no narcotics afterwards. There's no pain. And the patients do fantastic. They don't need a fusion. So we need to get the word out through a grassroots effort to let the world know. People who are told they need fusions, don't do it. If you're told you need an artificial disc, don't do it. Go and get a, an opinion, get your MRI reviewed for free from Duke Spine Institute, okay? And if you do that, you'll find that the laser surgery can be done better, safer, with better results. And then at that point, you can decide, do you wanna go through with the fusion or not? But at least find out if you're a candidate for the laser surgery, which I can tell you right now, 98% of spinal fusion patients are. There's only a few that are not. Any questions, John? Yes, one viewer was wondering, are you opening up the foramen more to relieve pressure on the nerve root? Am I opening up the foramen to relieve pressure on the nerve root? Yes. I haven't done it yet. I have, I have and haven't. So I've done it by going through the foramen with that dilator earlier you saw. I've pushed herniations from the foramen into the disc. By the way, that, that thing over there, that pink thing right by the laser tip, that's called the end plate, end plate. That's the S1 end plate, superior end plate. And that's little bleeding coming from the end plate, okay? We're not gonna mess with the end plate. The end plate's not the problem. There's the L5 end plate. So this disc has been damaged over time and the end plates are raw from inflammation, from inflammation from the injury to the disc. And that's how degeneration occurs. It's a vascular process, a process that is um, carried out by inflammation. Okay. And the longer you leave your damaged disc there, the more inflammation and damage occurs. That's a really important message to people. Doesn't mean we can't fix it, it just means it's harder to fix. And also, the longer you leave your damaged disc there causing pain, it starts to change the way you walk and stand, the way you work, and you start getting uh, secondary pain sources like piriformis syndrome, sacroiliitis, facet pain. All of those are secondary to the disc injury, the tear, which is causing the pain. Now there's her tear right there, and it's pretty scarred over. Some bubbles. How are you guys doing over there? Good? Everybody good? Yes, sir. All right. So we got one last surgery after this, and it's a young man who has a L12 herniation, pretty high up. I don't know how it happened originally, but he gets horrible back pain and spasms. Now, he is also from Canada. How many Canadian patients do we have here today? So we have one patient from Pennsylvania that we did earlier, and we have two from Canada, and one who's local. So there you go. Today it's three out of state and one in state, or one local. So Duke Spine Institute treats patients from all over the world. We don't discriminate against people for anything. We welcome everyone that has back and neck pain to help them. So we get people from all over the world. We even have somebody who may be coming from Puerto Rico, besides Luis. <laughs> yeah, talk to a, a, a potential patient who's in pain and very interested in our laser surgery and wants to get fixed. So, all right, so we're just actually almost done with the L5S1. There's a piece of herniation. want to avoid getting into that uh, bone again and causing any bony bleeding. Now you can see the epidural veins there, the red stuff. That's not granulation tissue there, that's veins. And epidural veins are normal. They're a normal part of this area. 
They bring uh, blood from this area back to the heart. And we, we want to try to leave them alone. This is all part of the tear right here. A little bit of fat right there in the foramen, in the lateral recess, so to speak. And, yep, everything's going quite well for this, this young lady. I think she's going to be very happy with her results. This is the tear and the herniation right here we're getting rid of. All this junk. Just about done with L5-S1. And then we'll focus on the next disc, which is the L4-5. Again, we call this an annular debridement, annular debridement. You won't find anything about it in medical journals except for the papers that we published here that talk about annular debridement. In the year 2012, we were the first ones to describe it surgically, the first ones to do it. And it treats the source of back pain and neck pain. Any questions or comments? John? Uh, yes. Another viewer is asking, how much post-operative pain management do these patients require? Any potential complications? All right. So one of the questions was, how much post-operative pain meds do they require? Yes. These patients all take Tylenol for their post-operative pain. Some of them take a muscle relaxer called Flexeril for one day. Most of them don't take it at all. And then we also have an anti-inflammatory they can take. So we recommend Tylenol and anti-inflammatory and muscle relaxer called Flexeril. So there's no narcotics. We don't use any powerful pain meds because they don't need it. This is a Band-Aid incision. What are the potential complications that can happen? Well, lots of complications can happen. You can have injuries to blood vessels and bleeding internally, hematomas, nerve damage, spinal fluid leak, infection, even death, paralysis, um, heart attack, stroke, pneumonia, abdominal organ injury, visceral injury, recurrent disc herniation, instability, all those things are possible, but they don't happen. We haven't had one of them happen. So they are possible, but um, we've been fortunate that we haven't had any, any complications to date. Now, one thing that does happen, and it happens about one in a hundred, is what's called a recurrent disc herniation. And what that means is, that we fix the herniation and then the patient squeezes out another one, all right, in the same place that I operated. And that does happen. And sometimes the patients can remember what they did, like lifting a suitcase or going to physical therapy and doing inappropriate physical therapy exercises. And sometimes they have no clue what causes it. And it's about 50-50. But what we tell everybody is wear your back brace for six weeks except in bed, and don't bend over and pick anything up from the ground. Don't put any, don't carry anything heavy, okay? And if you do those things, then you're, you should be fine. There's the nerve root in the foramen. That's the L5 nerve root. We're pretty much done here. We've gotten rid of the herniation at L5-S1. Slide on, please. So um, this is the safest spine surgery in the world. Why? Because every other spine surgery done has a higher complication rate than this surgery and has more serious complications. So this is the safest of all surgeries. Does it mean we, we can't have complications? No, we can. Of course we can have complications. If I make a mistake, there could be a complication or there could be a complication even if I don't make a mistake. But we've had a very good track record and in over a thousand surgeries, we didn't have any complications. So, all right, I'm putting some pressure um, because the tube has come out. There may be a little bit of vein bleeding, but we want to stop that before it even happens. So we put a little pressure. You need to put about 20 millimeters of mercury pressure on the muscle, and that keeps any kind of a blood clot from forming in the muscle. You don't want blood clots. Blood clot in the muscle will, will do more just causing pain for the patient and muscle spasms. 
So remember we talked about taking a muscle relaxer after surgery? The more irritated the muscles are from the surgery, which usually means there's some blood in there from the vein bleeding a little bit, which happens in every surgery, by the way. It's impossible to avoid. Um, but that blood irritates the muscles as it breaks down. And it usually takes about a month to break down. So people can have some muscle spasms for about a month after surgery if they have more blood clot than, than other people. But generally, nobody uses the muscle relaxer because they don't have any muscle spasms. It's rare. All right. We finished L5S1. Now we're going to do L4-5. I just want to get the guide wire in place shot. That looks good. We're going to get this um, needle out. That was a very good question, by the way. Hopefully uh, you are happy that I've given that answer because that's an extensive list of potential complications, ones we've not had here with the laser surgery, but could happen. Shot. All right. Uh, just need to get past the facet joint and under the nerve in the foramen, and we should be golden. There we are. Nice job. Yes. You want me to release or? Ah, uh, no. You no. can stay. Well, all right. Release for a minute. Yes. Shot. Some people don't like the hammering, but the hammering is necessary, Sean, because, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're not pushing on that tube. Now, you got to come more lateral. You're too midline. you got to be over the muscle. Otherwise, it doesn't do any good. Let me feel for a second. Yes, sir. Shot. Uh-huh. All right. Nope. Come off. You're fine. She's not happy with us. You're okay. All right, I'm going to wait until you get her a little more comfortable, and then we'll proceed. Now that's the reason why that's so stimulating for the patient is, okay, just lay still. You're fine is that's actually where the tear is that's causing all of her pain. And so, of course, we're, we're right on the tear. Yeah, you got to keep an eye on that. We're right on that tear, and that's where the source of her pain is. We're passing through it so we can repair it. And what I've done there is I've actually pushed the herniation back into the disc. So any kind of big chunky herniation fragments that are sitting there in the foramen or the lateral recess or in the tear, I've kind of pushed them back into the disc with that tube. So that's why she's responding. This, the, always the dilator going in, you gotta be ready to, you know, get the patient comfortable. Tell me when we're ready to proceed. All right. So nice job, Luis. Yeah, she's not responding now. Shot. So we're going to get this tube in. And yeah, I know it's kind of brutal to watch, but the reality is this is the safest way to do this. And that's why we do it this way. Safety is the most important thing in, in surgery. You know, number one, number two, number three, safety. Let's get the fluoro out. So we're inside the 045 disc now, please. Be careful. And we're going to repair the tear here. And we know this disc was a, what do we say, a 10 out of 10? 10, 10 out of 10. So both discs were 10 out of 10, right? Yes. Mm. Thank you. Just want to say I'm proud of my daughter. She made the um, top volleyball team in Orlando. She made the premier team on her first time trying out. She plays center for those volleyball fans out there. Middle, basically. It's the 
hopefully uh, things will go well for her. All righty, we are now at the L45 disc where the tear is, and you can see that there's a lot of scar tissue here from inflammation, chronic inflammation. This is not inflammation that's been going on for a day or a week. This is inflammation that's been going on for years. Look at that roof. <clears throat> that's terrible. That is the tear. And it just looks terrible. And look at the end plates, the vertebral end plates. Just full of scar tissue, all that white stuff, cheesy stuff, is um, scar tissue and bleeding, you know, from the inflammation. So this disc has been inflamed really badly. And you can see the inflammation extends all the way into the disc, even involves the end plate. So impressive. Any questions from our audience? Not at this time, no. Thanks, John. So for those of you watching, we have one more L12 disc to do after this lady that we're doing now. And it's a younger man who um, has a herniation on the right side at L12 with horrible history of horrible back pain that radiates across his back, doesn't have any leg symptoms. But the herniation is eccentric to the right, which is why I'm approaching it to the right. Gosh, look at all that scar tissue. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna wiggle my tube out and there's some more tear. Once again, just so, this has been going on a while, you can tell. This is not something that happened two weeks ago or three weeks ago. This is, you know, she could have re-injured it and people frequently re-injure their herniations to make them worse. So imagine you have a, a cut in your skin and it hurts and it's slowly healing and then somebody comes along after a week and rips it back open again. That's what re-injuring the disc is all about. And when you watch our animation that we're gonna have available for you released this week on our website and on the app um, and we're gonna start using it in our telemedicine and we'll probably start using it also on these broadcasts, you know? John, I'd like you to be able to show the audience what I'm talking about. So I want you to be able to switch to the animation, okay? Yep, well, as soon as we get that. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'd like to run the animation during the surgery in the bottom corner. Okay, yeah, we can try and get that all figured out. Yep, just talk to Sonny. And um, that way people that are watching the surgery can understand what we're doing. So we have one, at, one animation that's gonna show you the source of the pain and the annular tear with the inflammation and the pain signals go into the brain. We have another animation that will show you how the Duke laser disc repair is performed, how it works, what I'm actually doing here. Animations are great for teaching. Like this video right now is not so good for teaching because you really can't see what I'm doing. Fortunately, I've done enough of these. I know exactly what I'm doing. Uh, but with the bleeding from the end plates that are inflamed, unfortunately, it makes it harder for the audience to see. Now, this is our second patient today that has um, a lot of bleeding. So all that, you know, the fact you guys can't see, you see where it's coming from, the end plate right there and right there? That's literally just chronic arthritis inflammation in the disc. It's part of the pain process, but it's a sign that it's ongoing. It's never died off, and that's why this patient has had waves of pain over the years, suffering. She just keeps re-injuring her discs, re-herniating, re-tearing, and the pain cycles just keep going. All right, I'll probably need to grab her in a minute. Stand by. So I'll bring the grabber, my little pituitary in, a micro pituitary. Look how nice the picture is now. 
and I'm going to bring my tube back very close to being done. At 12 o'clock, you can see the epidural fat, but I need to clean that up over there a little more, okay? Once I take it out, it'll start to obscure a little bit. And what you're seeing is just that haze is literally red blood cells in the irrigation. The other word for it is hemorrhaging. But it's such a small amount, it is not significant at all. It's only causing visual impairment for me because this is a visually based surgery, so it's obscuring my view. But fortunately, I'm still able to do what I need to do with the laser. Any more questions? Stand by, grab her. Just about done, we no. need about five minutes max, doctor, and we'll be done. All right, very good. I'm gonna go zap a little more. I'm gonna look laterally, make sure I'm not leaving anything behind out there. So a lot of inflammation here inside her disc. Good news is it's all going to go away once we remove the cause, which is the interposed herniation. I'll look laterally, get rid of that. So kind of like having a little thorn of wood stuck in your finger and just festering, causing pain, pain, pain that never goes away. We've just pulled the thorn out and now the finger will heal. Grab her. And um, yeah, we're done, we're done. Done. So, yeah. Okay, so let's see what we've done here, folks. John, can you see? I'm going to take this tube out. We did the whole surgery through this tube. You see that, John? Yes, we can see it. It's a little tiny tube. It's about the diameter of a McDonald's shake straw. Here you go. So imagine having your back fixed with a small straw. Take that as wide as a McDonald's shake straw. Okay, seven millimeters. So this is as minimally invasive spine surgery as it comes. I'm familiar with all the minimally invasive types of spine surgery. This is the most minimally invasive. And the whole thing is done with a little cut, seven millimeters right there, you see that? We're gonna put pressure for another two minutes and then put a Band-Aid basically on there. All right, if you have questions for me, type them up onto your chat box and we'll answer them for you, okay? What's the question? Oh. Oh. You don't want me to answer it on the air, or you do want me to answer it? Oh, oh, got it. All right. <laughs> yeah, I won't, I won't ask this one. Um, but we do get this question quite a bit. So, no problem, no problem. Yeah, but it depends on exactly what type of activity. So, all right, type up your questions and I'll answer them.
That was probably one of the things I noticed right away was that like I had some control again, which was kind of cool, you know. You still have that sort of your brain's relearning where things are again. So now that you're you're back to getting healthy, it's it's starting to come back. You're starting to feel like you're you're able to play. But uh, but uh, yeah, I'll play. This song is called Oscar the Grouch Goes to the Movies. So yeah, we're a pretty musical family here. We do we play a lot of shows. We're in a band called Positive Chaos, and uh, this is my bass. Picked it up a little while ago. Um, we use it for acoustic shows. This is actually our guitarist's acoustic guitar. Um, he actually just moved down here from Connecticut, so it's kind of cool having him down. This is our violinist and my fiance's violin, who uh, has been in the band with us for a bunch of years now, and she's having some fun with that. This here's my acoustic guitar, um, which we'll be hanging out with later. And then this is our drummer's bassist of all things. So uh, yeah, that's, that's that guy. And uh, a couple months ago, it'd be pretty much impossible to pick this guy up off the wall without some pain. So it's kind of cool that I'm able to start doing that again um, from here. And I waited for you. So that was cool. Like uh, at this point, I wouldn't have been able to do this, I don't know, a month ago. And now I'm able to play guitar again. So it's kind of nice getting back. And uh, getting the band Positive Chaos back together is going to be pretty fun, and we're really looking forward to it. Thanks, Dr. Duke. And we know this is the way to live. And you keep on coming back. Um, yeah, so my name is Dave. Um, last year I was in an auto accident. It was August. Um, T bone accident in the area. Um, suffered some neck injuries. Basically, kind of uh, spent some months just kind of dealing with it, then decided to uh, talk to a chiropractor, started looking at it. All right. Let's do it. Hi, everyone. Dr. Duke Majin here with you. And we have just finished our third Duke Laser Disc Repair for the day. This patient came to us with back pain in the lower back at L45, L5S1 region. She had two herniated discs with two annular tears, one at L45, one at L5S1, and pain going down her left leg. Sometimes it would go all the way down to her foot, uh, most of the time down to her calf. We call that pain sciatica. So she had sciatic pain on the left side, down her leg. It was coming from irritation of the nerve roots at L45, L5S1, and that's all due to Basically, the disc herniation right there hitting that nerve, that yellow thing coming out of the hole called the neuroforamen. Those nerves go down your legs, and when they get irritated right there at the hole, they cause leg pain, sciatica. Now, the problem is that most surgeons don't understand why people get sciatica. They think it's because of a giant pinched nerve, a giant herniation pinching the nerve. The truth is 99% of the cases of leg symptoms come from small herniations. They're not giant, they're not put pinching the nerve, they're just irritating the nerve. And most surgeons won't operate on that, they won't even treat it because they don't understand how to fix it. At Duke Spine Institute we figured out, okay, if you go in there and clean that tear up where the herniation's bulging out of and get rid of the bulge, then the leg symptoms go away, even though there's not a big herniation pushing on the nerve. So that's one of the differences at Duke Spine Institute is we actually understand the cause of the symptoms and pain and we're able to fix it with the laser surgery. Whereas other surgeons will just blow you off and ignore it, saying that the herniation isn't big enough, it's just a bulge. They'll make all kinds of excuses. There's literally a, a list as long as my left arm of why they shouldn't treat it. And they'll tell you you're nuts, you're crazy. Um, even some people, that they're going to just tell them to go see a psychiatrist or go do pain pills or go do shots or do a morphine pump. Don't do any of those things. Your problem is completely fixable with a 30-minute procedure like we just did. And that will take the pain away. Um, we're going to have four patients tomorrow. Two of them are Canadian. One is local and one's from Pennsylvania. They'll be coming in and we'll be doing videos and posting them on our Facebook. And where else do we post these videos? YouTube? Yep. Yeah, YouTube page and Facebook. So Duke Spine is to YouTube and Facebook. And you will see these people, I'm, I'm sure their pain will be gone in their back and left. Okay? So that's how confident I am in the disease 
the cause and the cure, which is the Duke Laser District Day. All right, what's our first question? Yes, so one viewer is asking, what does this patient's recovery look like? So this patient um, literally has a, you know, quarter inch incision on her back and her recovery will be one hour and then she'll go home. Will she drive today? No, because she had anesthesia. You're not allowed to drive the same day. That's just the general rule for all anesthesia. Will she feel like she can drive today? Absolutely. In about two hours from now, she's going to be wide awake, back to normal, and feel great. Um, we're going to send her home in about an hour. And she can't drive, but she has an adult who's going to take her home. And um, the recovery literally is one hour. By tomorrow, she can go back to work. She can go shopping. She can go to restaurants. I mean, she can do whatever she wants except for uh, bending at the waist. You have to restrict the bending. No bending over to pick things up. Otherwise, you can pop out another herniation pretty easily. So I got her in a back brace. She's going to live in that thing. Whenever she's out of bed, she's going to wear that for the next six weeks. Just to remind her not to bend over. The second thing is lifting. I don't want these patients lifting anything over 25 pounds for six weeks. 25 pounds, six weeks. Simple. The reason for that is not the recovery from the surgery, but the healing of the disc that we just repaired. Now, I got rid of all the grunge and inflammation and stuff that was causing inflammation. I got rid of the tear and the herniation. However, I cannot speed up yet. I cannot yet speed up the healing of the disc. And I'm laughing because I do have a way to heat, speed, heat up the, the healing up, speed up the healing of the disc. I apologize, but um, it it has not yet been um, it has not yet been studied, and um, I'm not ready to start doing it yet. But there will be a day when I have a little more time to um, further investigate this option and to implement it, okay? And I think it will cause the disc to heal faster, much faster. I just not ready to use it. Uh, I don't believe in doing things half-baked, half-assed, and especially when it comes to human beings and their health. Of course, it'll be FDA approved. I would never dream of doing something that isn't, uh, but it could be something that's very simple. But no, we cannot speed up the healing of the disc yet and the disc takes a long time to heal. Why? Because the disc itself doesn't have much blood supply. All the blood supply for the disc comes from the outer uh, periphery of the disc, the outside. Basically this part that circles the disc, that's where the blood supply is. But the blood supply stops like literally a few millimeters into the disc. It just stops right there. So for the tear to heal completely, you need blood supply, you need lots of nutrients and vitamins and energy and glucose. So all that has to get there so they could rebuild, the body can be rebuilding that disc and healing it properly. But it takes six months to a year to fully heal, okay? Depending on the person. Uh, and then the next question is, if someone was already had this procedure and they re ruptured this, can you do the same procedure to fix it? So the question is, if someone has the Duke laser disc repair and they did great, then they re-rupture the disc, can we do the Duke laser disc repair again to fix it? Yes, you can, 100%. You can do it again. What's the chance after that that it's going to work long term? I would say probably 90%. What's an alternative? Instead of doing another Duke laser disc repair, you could clean out the disc and do a fusion with screws and rods. I'm not recommending that, but that could be an alternative treatment. So what I recommend anytime somebody has back pain or neck pain from a annular tear, bulging disc, or a herniated disc, do the Duke laser disc repair first. It'll probably work 98% of the time long term. Maybe 2% of the time you'll re-herniate and have the symptoms come back and you'll need another surgery done. Okay? We can never guess who those 2% will be. It's impossible to know. I can't look at an MRI, I can't look at a patient. It's really hard to predict yet. We don't have a way to predict who's gonna re-rupture re their disc. Um, but I do know it's related to 
um, heavy lifting and bending at the waist to pick things up. That I know for sure. So anytime you're healing from the surgery, make sure you take it easy. Give your disc a chance to fully heal before you go too heavy on the activity. That's our last question according to John. Thank you for joining us. We have one more surgery to go and it'll be a L12. So much higher up on the spine. For those of you interested, we're going to have to start the needle placement is going to be more medial, more towards the midline. You don't want to be too lateral at L12, otherwise you can hit the kidney. That's a little pearl of information I'm sharing. Okay, but um, yeah, you got to be really careful uh, at L12 to start more medial. Okay, thanks.